Um, and I'm here with Kenan Orhan. Uh, you'll know me from maybe books you've read like um, Less or Less is Lost. And um, I was the editor uh, in 2022 of the Best American Short Stories. And one of the stories I chose was by, by Kenon, and it is in uh, the new collection that's out in April. I am my country, so I'm here to first to meet him in person and to, um, to ask some questions. Hi, welcome, Kenon. Well, thank you, thank you very much. I'm very excited. Hello, my name is Kenon Orhan, and my story collection, I Am My Country, is out from Random House, April 25th. It's a book set in Turkey, about uh, small rebellions, I would say. The characters are rather desperate on the skids. They're facing their own personal disasters amid the backdrop of national calamities. And they're struggling to kind of make sense, or at least, if not sense of their unusually absurd situations, at least uh, make meaning, uh, make meaningful lives and, and continue to strive and persevere against uh, oppression in, I think, surprisingly small ways. I, the first thing I, I've got to know is about the story that, that I read and fell in love with. And in fact, I taught it in a class at Stanford uh, this last spring and my students, they just loved it. They really loved it. Um, it's set in Turkey um, and it is, um, has a reasonable beginning of a woman who's a garbager who begins picking up things you wouldn't expect in the trash as they become outlawed by the government, like uh, the various uh, Western instruments. And then finally, the, 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 the people who play the instruments until she can assemble an orchestra. And um, I, I, the easy way to talk about it is an, it's an absurdist, but how did you stumble upon that way of addressing, many would write about Turkey in a much more direct and serious way. Yeah, uh, I would I would probably chalk that up to my appreciation for levity first. Um, there's just uh, this lightness I really enjoy in work, and I, and I consider that Calvino's uh, lightness uh, as an influence of me. Um, but I, I just enjoy authors that like to have fun, both with language and situations. You know, the, the poetic side, the lyrical side, is kind of fun with language. And then I think the magical side is sort of fun with the rules as we know them of reality. Um, but also I've found it's been very convenient to use absurdity and sort of strange situations to really hit home the absurdity and strangeness that is plaguing Turkey right now. Um, currently the head of the regime, um, there was an instance where someone posted a picture of him with comparing him to Gollum, the Lord of the Rings character. And he had that person immediately jailed and then fined and they stood trial. And it's like, that's a really absurd thin skinned thing to do. Um, and if you just present that as fact, yeah, okay. Um, it's a fact and it's sad and it's absurd, uh, but it's not as impactful in fiction. And so I think fiction can explore sort of these absurd things in, in slightly more nuanced or interesting or just magical ways that really kind of explore the ineffable or the difficult to say, um, the same way art or symphonies uh, sort of explore the difficult things to say. I think magic in fiction um, can broach those hard to name or, or hard to hard to put into word uh, things. So. I, I, I find that really true too about, about, um, about comedy, like when I found a way to do that that I could get closer to actual emotions than yeah. even though it seems like the opposite, but it feels more right. true. Yeah, as you leave, as you leave fact or reality, you start to hit, you start to hit the emotional responses that fact and reality produce um, just in different ways. Uh, I think you hit them, you hit them harder, but definitely com comedy is great at that. And I think you're in a, a great tradition that seems sort of Eastern European of poking fun at these uh, oppressive. And it feels like if you can, when you poke fun at them and it works, like you've won in a way that can never be. Yeah, you really get under the skin. And I, I got to chalk that up to a lot of Czech writers. I read uh, it, it, during my MFA program, I was reading uh, Bohumil Hrabo, um, uh, Vaclav and uh, Kundera, and I was just... I was like, these guys are having fun. I, I kind of want to get in on that. I've seen in interviews that you said that 
that these stories have to be set in Turkey. That you do, for instance, you didn't choose like an unnamed state like a lot of other maybe Calvino would do, but you chose specifically has to be Turkey. Why is that? Um, I think you could make a lot of the same sort of universal claims about oppression and, and tyrannical regimes doing the namelessness. But Turkey, I really wanted to set out and write about Turkey because um, we used to go there every summer. I have family there um, and we'd spend our summers there um, right up until 2012. We were going to go in 2013, but plans changed. And then as it would happen, this huge protest uh, swept the country uh, against sort of government overreach, uh, police brutality. And I, I felt a little like I was missing out, um, but it also kind of awoke this political anger in me. Um, but it, as much as these stories are, are me exploring a very particular political anger and being very upset with a very particular regime, um, I don't get to go to Turkey anymore. Uh, it's been it's been a long time. Um, for a while there, people thought it might be dangerous. And then I started writing about it. And then they're like, yes, it's definitely dangerous for you. Um, so I, I haven't been. And I feel like these stories, because I didn't start writing about Turkey. Um, so when I started writing about Turkey, it, it was a way for me to sort of crystallize or, or self-preserve an aspect of me, like hold on to these memories. Because as we all know, memories are very fleeting and, and they change over time. Um, and it was such a such a golden era. It, it occupies this wonderful niche of my mind, Turkey does, especially Istanbul. And I, I didn't want to lose that. And so I started kind of exploring stories just to, one, to keep me connected to it, uh, two, to hold on to the memories, and then and three, to take a stand um, in the political realities of the country. I, I say this is a collection about small rebellions, but I admit that, you know, one of the <laughs> One of the characters is a desperate florist who goes so far as to plot an assassination. Um, but this isn't this isn't the grand gesture that we all have to do. Sometimes, you know, an act of rebellion can be as simple as as existing in your own skin. Um, and I, I hope that readers can can see these stories and can see themselves in these stories as you know the world around us sort of descends into into chaos in a way um, we can all still validly explore small small hopes small desperations uh, small stands against oppression i think you, i i i know quite a few turkish writers that have all taken different tacks one of them is to leave the country mm -hmm. forever and 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 to write with anger and other i know some turkish writers have stayed and they write with very careful precision yeah but i think <laughs> you have a particular freedom to 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 go with, in fact, the stories don't have a sense of hopelessness or despair to me, which separates you maybe from some Czech writers. Um, I do. I mean, do you think that's true? Or no, I would agree. And I think I think what separates me from the Czechs then is my Turkish sense of humor. Um, I think I think they love laughing. At, it's it's almost a national pastime laughing at your own calamities. Um, I don't want to get too general with that claim, but in my experiences, um, I would say there's a sense of hope uh, for a lot of these characters in, in reading them, though I don't think any of the characters would admit that themselves. Um, I think they're just, I think they're plugging away because they don't have a lot of other options. I, I've really, I've really enjoyed exploring what it is that, that people do when they are not given many options to, to pursue um, uh, against oppression. And so how they sort of strike out in, in interesting and surprising and usually not uh, totally overt or, or grand gestures. Um, although that can happen, uh, I think for the most part, it's a, it's a really interesting response, human response to in the face of overwhelming oppression, overwhelming uh, strife to, a, almost ignore it. I, I don't want to say ignore, but I did I almost ignore it and continue to just make meaning uh, for for oneself um, to find to find that hope that is plugging along when all the road signs point to stopping. Um, and I, 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 I count myself um, a, a huge admirer of that, if not, it's uh, if not a practitioner. So I was like, well, I better go all in and just write because other people can't. 
Um, so it's it's been a way for me to not take voice out of other authors, but I think bring an audience to these other authors who are doing something more subtle. I think I could be a good gateway to a lot of great Turkish literature that exists, um, but might just be just a little out of reach for an American audience. I think that's great saying that you write these stories because other people can't. I think that I think that's very true. And I think it's part of what my students really loved about these these story. Well, they only read one story of yours, but they'll they'll love them all. Um, when the book comes out in April. Um, so um, thank you so much for having this chat with me. I'm glad to finally get to meet you. Um, yeah, yeah, it's been my pleasure. Well, I'm thrilled for when the book comes out. Me too, very, very excited. Thank you very much uh, for everything. Thanks for the questions, very, very thoughtful. Uh, got me thinking about my own work even. Good. <laughs>